is um, enjoy, uh, you ready? ready? Live. Uh, good evening, everyone, um, and welcome to um, our live stream of uh, tonight's uh, uh, Bible study. Uh, well, as usual, first of all, we'll begin with the uh, uh, prayer, Heavenly King. O heavenly King, comfort the spirit of truth, for it everywhere present and fills all things, treasury of blessings and giver of life. Come and abide in us and cleanse us from every impurity, save our souls a good one. Right. Now, Costa, as usual, has sent out uh, the emails to everyone, and so you should be aware that we've got two topics, God willing, tonight. Um, I... Don't know how far we'll get into the second topic, but uh, <clears throat> because the first one is a substantial one, um, and <laughs> the second one is even bigger, uh, well, in terms of uh, what we're going to do uh, eventually, but uh, well, actually, the first one is, <laughs> you know, you could sp spend a a whole course talking about the first topic too. So our topics tonight are uh, Hebraic aspects of the gospel, and the second one is um, uh, the Sermon on the Mount. Um, I don't think we'll, we're likely to get to the actual text of the Sermon on the Mount uh, tonight. Uh, we'll probably finish off with some preliminary uh, comments, uh, observations about what this uh, major piece uh, of the gospel is about. All right, so mm, let's begin with the Hebrew aspects of, of the gospel. Well, first of all, um, <clears throat> because there has been a centuries-old divide between uh, Christians and Jews, I think that we Christians can easily forget that the gospel is really a, a continuum of Holy Scripture that goes back to the time of Moses. Um, yes, admittedly, it is the fulfillment of those things which the Old Testament talks about, but even the language, uh, uh, just adjust some adjustments here. Okay, uh, rewrite. Mm -hmm. Just turning your video on. Pardon me, my operator is just making just some fine tuning here. Yeah. Okay, Chris. Almost. Good. Good. All right. So uh, this is the thing. Now, gospel. Uh, the gospel, and I use the, the term here in, in the singular, even though, of course, we're talking about the four gospels. But in a sense, uh, it is just the one message, one gospel message. Um, so it's four books, but it's really like one book. Um, it is a book that is written by Jews uh, and its message directed as St. Paul writes to the Romans. I quote, uh, to the Jew especially, but equally to the Gentile. Well, that's Romans chapter 1, verse 16, um, beginning of uh, this important uh, first letter of uh, St. Paul. Um, we tend to forget that um, with the sort of hindsight that we have uh, of so many centuries that in the first generation, 
uh, one problem of fundamental importance for the early church, for the church of the holy apostles, was to decide whether it was possible for um, people who come into the church from a Gentile, non-Jewish background, uh, would it be possible for them to become Christians, to be baptized without keeping to the complexities of the law of Moses? And that's covered in uh, chapter 15 um, and further in the book of Acts and uh, Galatians, uh, the letter of St. Paul to Galatians. Um, the gospel and the entire New Testament is immersed in Old Testament scripture. But scripture language and culture. The, example, the examples are so numerous that they're just impossible uh, to list. You know, you would need volumes to talk about that. To prepare tonight's talk, one of the things I used was um, uh, the Jewish Study Bible, which is written by Messianic Jews for uh, Jews and Christians. So it has the, the Old Testament and New Testament with commentaries. Um, and he, uh, before it tackles the actual text of um, the Old Testament and subsequently the New Testament, it lists 54 cases um, of prophecy of the Old Testament fulfilled in the New Testament. Just uh, it's divided into columns and, you know, it quotes uh, from the Old Testament book and in the adjacent column uh, where this is fulfilled in the first coming of Christ. That there are some prophecies of the Old Testament that have yet to be fulfilled in Christ's second coming. Uh, yes, so uh, let's just give you a couple of examples of, uh, you know, the aspect of language and the language of the gospel. You are aware now that the Lord Jesus Christ and his disciples and the evangelists spoke a Semitic language that uh, the, um, the Israelites picked up, learned, and ad uh, adopted, uh, because it was similar to their ancient Hebrew, of course, um, quite similar, uh, a Semitic language uh, called Aramaic. Yes. So let's have a look at this scene. You know, the beginning of uh, the first chapter of the Gospel of Matthew, where the angel of the Lord appears to Joseph in a dream and um, tells him that uh, he sh should name the baby that is going to be born Jesus because he's going to save his people from their sins. Now, without knowing what the name Jesus means, it's impossible to... Uh, to understand where the connection is. But uh, uh, actually the, the name Jesus in English, right? The way it sounds in English, it's a, it's a corruption uh, of the Hebrew and Aramaic Yeshua, uh, which is the masculine form of the noun Yeshua salvation so yeshua is savior 
Um, <clears throat> so that's one example, one of many. Uh, but here's a, an example that's a little bit more involved and needs more explanation. From chapter 1 in Matthew, we go to chapter 1 in John, the, the, the last uh, gospel, and uh, in, in, in that prologue, which is um, um, read in the Orthodox lectionary, actually begins the uh, annual lectionary at Easter, uh, at the litur uh, Easter liturgy, uh, you know, in the beginning was the word, etc. Um, it says there, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. That's John chapter 1, verse 14. Now, dwelt among us, is in Greek that John used, as well as all the other uh, evangelists, as you know, uh, is rendered this way. Dwelt among us, eskinosen enimin. Eskinosen, a dwelt. Um, the, the root there is the word skini. Skini means a tent or a tabernacle. So this is a verb uh, in Greek that uh, John used to convey a really rich picture uh, that is not conveyed by the word dwelt at all. Uh, because uh, think of it this way, what he's saying is that uh, it's a connection um, that he, uh, uh, the word, came and dwelt uh, in, in the tabernacles with us. So it's a reference to the 40 years in the wilderness and <clears throat> how uh, the word, uh, the, the, how God was present um, with the people uh, in, in his glory, uh, Shahina, the glory of God, was visibly present with the people above the um, um, uh, tabernacle. During the day, it was the cloud, uh, and at night, this cloud shone. Uh, so this is the uh, sign of the presence of the glory of God. So see how complex an image is used uh, uh, in uh, John's description of well, just a simple statement that the word became flesh and dwelt among us, right? So it's talking about a very close and loving uh, relationship between the word in the flesh and uh, in his presence among the people uh, in Israel at that time. It, when Peter and the two Zebedee brothers, James and John, were up with the Lord on Mount Tabor, and they experienced this uh, sense of closeness uh, to God through the transfiguration of Christ, Peter cried out um, just unconsciously, uh, not knowing what he was saying. He says, Lord, how good it is to be here. Let's make three tents here. One, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. Um, again, that was his perception of that very intimate uh, and loving closeness uh, that God had with uh, the Israelites in the time of Moses. And it happened even in a greater uh, way with the coming of Christ, of course. 
Yes. Um, so that's uh, about language. Now, let's uh, have a look at um, some illustrations of, um, or some examples of um, cultural, cultural things that are mentioned in, um, in the gospel. Now, you've all heard um, this word, or it's two words, bar mitzvah, okay? Um, this is a ceremony, uh, uh, actually, there are two, uh, bar mitzvah and bat mitzvah. Uh, so bat mitzvah means, bar mitzvah means son of the commandment, and uh, bat mitzvah's daughter of, of the commandment. Um, it's a time when uh, girls and boys uh, reach this age of around 12, and uh, they are accepted as uh, members of, of the community with uh, responsibility for their life. And I should be that uh, <clears throat> it's possible for uh, a 12 year old to become a member of what's called the prayer quorum. Uh, 10 people uh, in the synagogue that are uh, required to have a, uh, a prayer meeting. Um, you know, in the New Testament, the Lord Jesus Christ cut it down to two or three. He says, We're two or three again, I don't mind that. You know, that's fine. Uh, much smaller quorum. But in the Old Testament, 10 people were required. Um, there were nine adult uh, men and a 12-year-old. Uh, that would be fine. So we have a story in, um, in Luke, which we've already looked at. Uh, the story of the visit of um, the Holy Family. Now, this is a Western expression, but, you know. Uh, popular in the West, uh, not used as much uh, in the East, but uh, uh, well, it was a, a, fa a family, of course. Uh, it was the mother of God, 12-year-old uh, uh, Jesus, um, and uh, Joseph, uh, uh, his ostensible father. So it's a very important story. And the ironic thing is that even though um, Jews to this day celebrate this uh, event. There is no description or ref uh, direct reference to this in the Old Testament at all. <laughs> and, um, whereas the New Testament has the story of uh, Bar Mitzvah, uh, uh, of uh, the Lord, uh, where he is brought to Jerusalem and he um, shows uh, that he is indeed uh, a mature participant in the discussions uh, about the Bible, about the law. Uh, right. <clears throat> okay, uh, so Here's another example of um, a cultural aspect in the gospel that can't be understood without some knowledge of um, the, um, the life, uh, the, the life around the temple in the days of Christ. Now, the Lord says, don't be like hypocrites. Don't trumpet, um, uh, you know, before yourselves when you are uh, praying or doing good things or when you are uh, when you're giving alms. Okay. Um, <clears throat> this expression, trumpet, um, actually 
becomes much more alive when we know uh, when we come to uh, when we know that the money boxes which were big in the temple were shaped in the form of a trumpet with uh, a narrow um, a narrow top, top part where people would throw the money in with sort of a long uh, neck go expanding to the bottom and uh, these uh, money boxes looked like trumpets but the hypocrites in order to draw attention to themselves they would throw a lot of coins in together which would make um, you know a lot of noise uh, in the metal the copper or brass wall against the copper or brass walls and echoing in this uh, trumpet uh, money box so that's what they used to do uh, it's not talking about uh, literal trumpets uh, that are, are being blown uh, <clears throat> and uh, well how about the story at the end of the gospel when uh, Christ is challenged by some Pharisees who say, well, they, they try to catch him with a trick question. They say, teacher, tell us, is it lawful to pay tribute to the Caesar? You know, obviously an awfully dangerous question because had he said, yes, it is lawful, then um, he would have been seen as a traitor to the Jewish national cause. If he said, it's not lawful, he would have been reported immediately to the Romans. Uh, it's sort of a no-win situation. And remember how he answers. He says, uh, hypocrites, show me a, a, a coin that uh, you know, is used. Uh, <clears throat> of course, Romans introduced their coins. And he said, whose image and superscription is, is on this coin? They said, Caesar's. Well, they said, uh, well, uh, then he said, well, then give Caesar's unto, uh, what is Caesar unto C uh, Caesar and what is God unto God? Now, we, of course, uh, it's understandable, uh, even without not knowing the, the cultural background, which I'm going to tell you now, uh, that he is delineating between two spheres, you know, the, the sphere of uh, God and the sphere in the political sphere. That's all fine. But um, it became immediately apparent to them what he was talking about. They, there was no way they could uh, even argue about it because, uh, you see, the Roman money was considered unclean. Uh, in the temple, and you could not donate with Roman money because it had uh, images of uh, the emperor. Uh, and imagery was forbidden, this sort of imagery. So uh, this is where the money changers come in. The money changers used to change the Roman money into a currency that was used only at the temple. So coins that had uh, an impression of uh, and a picture uh, you can look them up you know uh, they are available in some collections um, uh, temple money uh, shekels so people used to come and uh, change the money and donate the temple money right so this is why they understood very literally that he said you use these uh, roman coins uh, and <laughs> you, you don't turn away from them you use them in civil uh, life so that's fine uh, use that and you know and pay taxes out of that but for god there's something else so um, it you know this cultural aspect really illustrates uh, the point very richly. Um, now, 
Of course, out of the four Gospels, we have already discussed that the first of the Gospels, Matthew, um, was directed specific, specifically for a Jewish audience. Uh, whilst Mark was written in Rome um, and uh, addressed predominantly to Romans and other Gentiles, so was uh, Luke, and, uh, <clears throat> right, and out of the uh, synoptics. John, John's gospel, of course, was written uh, much later after the destruction uh, of Jerusalem in the first Jewish war. So it's written for the benefit of the whole church, for you know, the entire um, uh, church. So because Matthew wrote uh, for his brothers, first of all, um, because prior to the destruction of the temple, and then, and the, you know, the first Jewish war, the apostolic generation had hoped that their uh, brethren would accept uh, Jesus as the Christ. And so it was imperative to write a specific address to them. And that's what Matthew does. So this is why Matthew has... Um, well, it's understood in, in his presentation that his audience knows the Bible uh, very well because he gives uh, around 80 direct quotations from the, from the Old Testament uh, as well as many oblique references to it, to the, right? And now uh, the beginning of the Gospel of Matthew has, as you will remember, this, this is a, a reading that is done uh, before uh, Christmas in the Orthodox Church with the listing of the, the uh, generations, the genealogy of, uh, of Christ okay, from Abraham. And so, in listing all those uh, patriarchs from Abraham, uh, going through all the, the patriarchs and the kings and so on, uh, it uh, really, really connects well to the what what precedes it. You know, the Old Testament books. And it's a con connecting link. It's genealogy, and. It connects to the depths of the Old Testament through this because of the multitude of names mentioned uh, in the genealogy. Now, another interesting thing is, and we have, I haven't mentioned this yet, but uh, it is a fact that the Gospel of Matthew is divided into five parts. They're not equal parts, but they're thematic parts that um, symbolically, as it were, replicate the five books of Moses. Uh, and each one of those parts, five parts, ends with the same phrase. When uh, I quote, when Jesus had finished saying these things, etc. Um, <clears throat> so interesting, isn't it? Clearly, Matthew presents um, Jesus Christ as the prophet of whom Moses spoke when Moses, in his uh, last speech to the people of Israel in the desert, he said, God will send you a prophet like me. Listen to him. These are the words that are repeated by God the Father on Mount Tabor. And Peter, James, and John hear this in the presence of uh, Moses, who is with Jesus there. 
Um, so, see the connection? Five books. Uh, Moses had five books. Uh, and um, Matthew presents his gospel as five books. Of course, they're much uh, smaller, than, uh, but it doesn't matter. Um, it's, it's not about volume or number, the number of words here. Um, it's about uh, uh, their importance. Um, so, and this um, picture of um, uh, the Lord Jesus Christ as the second Moses is certainly shown in the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, <clears throat> and I'll just go through a number of sort of parallels and juxtapositions between uh, Moses receiving the law on Mount Sinai and Christ, Jesus Christ, giving or interpreting the law um, in his Sermon on the Mount. Uh, but uh, before we get to that, I'd just like to say that uh, the Sermon on the Mount um, is presented very fully in the Gospel of Matthew. It takes three chapters, five, six, seven. Not that these chapters existed um, in the time of Matthew, and they, they are uh, you know, a, a much more recent edition, you know, medieval uh, European edition, as I think I would have said when we began talking about the gospel. But uh, nevertheless, uh, three chapters is, is, is quite a long passage. Now, mm, the Sermon on, on the Mount is also presented by Luke, uh, but uh, it takes part of uh, chapter 6 in Luke, uh, verse, uh, tw uh, from verse 12 to verse 49. And there are uh, some other sayings that can be found uh, in uh, Matthew's presentation of the Sermon on the Mount in Luke, uh, just in different places. Um, so we're going to, of course, in studying the Sermon on the Mount, concentrate mainly on uh, Matthew's uh, presentation because it's fuller, and we will occasionally refer to the way that Luke um, says. Uh, these things are similar things. Uh, again, we've got uh, right uh, from the beginning these cultural uh, differences. For instance, uh, Matthew says that Jesus went up to the mountain and sat, sat down to teach. Uh, Luke uh, presents presents um, the sermon uh, in his description, the, the, the Lord presents the sermon standing up. Now, it's, it's not really important how it happened, but in a literal sense, of course, the Lord would have sat down uh, <clears throat> because uh, this was the custom of the rabbis. When rabbis taught, they would teach sitting down. But in Western tradition, and Luke writes for Westerners, um, orators always, you know, whether they were in Greece or Rome, would stand up in addressing people. All right. Um, 
I mean, we could go into various little nuances of how to uh, reconcile uh, <laughs> this different, uh, the small difference, but it might be just, you know, the cultural way of doing it, you know, that Luke uh, needed to, to do it for, for the Westerners that way. Matthew uh, talks about it uh, literally. All right. So let's have a look at um, um, these um, this, the juxtapositions. Uh, so imagine the picture in Exodus when Moses uh, is up on Mount Sinai, a very arid and uh, rocky and rather uninviting sort of a landscape, uh, this tall rocky mountain. Uh, arid hills and rocky uh, 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 sort of places all around it uh, in the Arabian desert. When Moses was up on the mountain and the people of Israel watched the top of the mountain, they uh, saw um, all of these uh, lightnings and they heard thunder uh, and uh, loud tr uh, trumpets in the uh, ravines. Um, contrast that with the picture of Christ presenting the Sermon on the Mount. It's slightly up from the shores of a beautiful freshwater lake in spring uh, where there's green grass everywhere and flowers, um, a cool breeze blowing from the lake. Now back to uh, Sinai, there was a line drawn at the foot of the mountain and uh, Israelites were forbidden to cross this line to get any closer to the mountain uh, under the fear of death. Um, Christ, when he sits down to teach about the uh, the life of his disciples, of New Israel, when he interprets the ancient law, how it is to be understood properly, uh, not how the Pharisees uh, distorted some of the um, interpretations. He is surrounded by people at close range. They might have actually been rubbing against him, you know, and so uh, this large crowd of people close up to him. Um, no fear at all. Um, a loving, um, uh, uh, you know, relaxed uh, uh, scene there. Also, he begins, the Lord begins uh, his Sermon on the Mount with the presentation of the Beatitudes. The Beatitudes uh, begin with the, the phrase, blessed are they, you know, blessed, each one of them, each uh, one of the nine begins with that phrase, blessed. Okay, now blessed 
uh, is a word that doesn't mean blessing, because in English the word blessing, uh, its origins are uh, the pagan use of sprinkling with blood. But uh, blessed comes from the word bliss. Bliss is happiness, it's the ultimate happiness. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> um, it's a, the many Hebrew and Aramaic words have a, a number of meanings, or the, the, they have a whole spectrum, or uh, they cover a whole spectrum of meanings. So, uh, in the original, uh, the word blessed means not only happy, uh, but uh, a number of other things. Um, and this bliss is used as an incentive because human beings were created to search for happiness, you know, as it's reflected in the American um, Constitution, you know, this pursuit of happiness is obviously a biblical concept, even though it has become very secular uh, in, uh, in that document uh, and its understanding. But the uh, origin of uh, those things, are, uh, uh, that document is, you know, many expressions are biblical. And um, so, yes, the pursuit of happiness is something that is instilled in, uh, in mankind. And so instead of fear, you know, you cross that line, you break that commandment, you know, you're going to get it. Um, a different approach uh, is used here. Uh, an encouragement, come, uh, do this because you will find um, happiness, bliss through doing the commandments of God. Um, Mind you, I'd like to remind you that the lawgiver in both cases is the same person, the Son of God, because he is the one who speaks to Moses uh, at Mount Sinai. But uh, at that time, with the uh, need to raise this, you know, rather primitive. Uh, tribe or uh, nations, a little nation to a higher level, it needed very strict, uh, strict laws. Um, it needed the, uh, you know, what psychologists would say, <laughs> say now, negative reinforcement. Christ uses positive reinforcement, okay? The same Son of God, but Three and a half thousand years later, uh, sorry, not three and a half, but we're three and a half thousand, uh, uh, 1500 years later, um, uses uh, positive reinforcement. Uh, you know, wants to make it sound uh, appealing to, to us. So the law of Moses. Um, was the law of the, of righteousness that sought to cut off any evil. Uh, it tried to uh, limit evil, but it did not give the strength uh, it did not give the resources, the uh, spiritual and emotional resources to human, uh, uh, physical as well, to human beings to be able to fulfill this law. And so the law was given uh, as Christ, uh, as, uh, sorry, as uh, uh, Paul, St. Paul explains, that it was, a, uh, the law was a teacher unto Christ. It was designed to show up our weakness. We're unable to keep the law. 
And at the end of the law, it said, cursed is he that does not fulfill all the law. And this, there were 613 commandments there, as, as we've said before. All right? Not just 10, 613. Uh, that's how many commandments uh, you can count in the five books of Moses. All right? And the various punishments for failing to, uh, to fulfill the law. And, you know, you're cur you were cursed for not keeping the whole law. And so uh, this is uh, the explanation why the, the Pharisees kept asking Christ, what is the most important commandment in the law? Because it was important for them to know. Uh, all right, they would think, I know it's impossible to fill, fulfill the whole law, all those 613 commandments. But at least if I uh, keep the most important commandment, then I should be right. That was the rationale, okay? The reason. Now, uh, the New Testament uh, law and the way that Christ really interprets the Old Testament law in his Sermon on the Mount is about the law of mercy and love, which in itself gives the strength, the power to the uh, power of God to enable us to keep this law. And as one begins seriously to, to try and keep these commandments, they, they work as these, uh, there are nine steps. We're going to talk about them in, in greater detail, of course, but uh, you know, we're now beginning to run out of time. And uh, so you know, I'm be beginning to sort of round things off here. So as we begin to keep the first commandment, through this, we gain the, uh, the energy to rise the, to the next step. And then after doing the, the second, we can rise to the third and so on. All right, that's how it works. So to sum up, the difference between uh, the law of Moses is that, uh, and the law of, of Christ is that the uh, law of Moses was severe. The law of uh, Christ is very gentle. Um, at the same time, of course, um, the law of Moses was designed to control mainly the external behavior of human beings. It wasn't this was designed to, uh, to explain to people, as Christ explains in his uh, Sermon on the Mount, that, you know, good and evil come from within the person, you know, from our thoughts, from as subsequent generations of um, Christian struggles would develop this whole teaching about the God-given energies uh, distorted in, uh, in the fall called the passions. That's, um, that's a big uh, topic in itself. Uh, what else can I just uh, say here to finish it off? So basically, the Sermon on the Mount is, it can be called, you know, the moral teaching of the New Testament, or it can be called um, the Messiah's interpretation of the Old Testament law. Same thing. And we, we see now that there is an obvious connection uh, between uh, the, the beginnings in the Old Testament, the law there, um, the law of Moses and um, how it should be understood in, from, from the vantage point of uh, the New Testament, uh, New Testament revelation. 
All right. Um, I think we're uh, getting close to uh, the one hour point. And um, I'll just round it up there. Any, anything there? No questions, okay. Well, uh, look, God willing, uh, we'll meet again um, in a fortnight's time and you will get an email from Chris. Oh, sorry, not from Chris. <laughs> Chris is is the uh, operator from Costa. Sorry, uh, sorry, Costa. Uh, yes, and thank you for your uh, diligent work. Costa always reminds me to uh, come up with uh, you know the topics and the references. And um, last time, someone commented that you know it would be good if uh, people knew earlier, uh, you know, when we'd be meeting and. Um, also the topics and the references and so on. So all good there. Uh, and um, see you uh, God willing next time. And uh, we'll just finish off with the, uh, the prayer as usual. It is truly made to bless the Atheotokos, ever blessed and most pure and the mother of our God, more honorable than the cherubim, beyond compare, more glorious than the seraphim. Without corruption, they gave us birth to God the word. True Theotokos, they do we magnify.